Battle for Zendikar Sealed um, that just recently came up for uh, one of the Grand Prix, and we're going to talk a little bit more about Sealed. Um, a lot of people do draft, and I love draft. I love playing draft. Uh, competitively, draft is something that you do at the top tables in the top eight. But the fact of the matter is, to get there, if you're going to be doing competitive, um, limited competitive events, you're going to play more Sealed than you will draft. Uh, and working your way towards that, and understanding the difference between draft format and sealed is a big difference. People are, there's a lot of nuance on it. A lot of people think what holds true for draft will hold true for sealed, and that's not always the case. So we're going to kind of investigate that a little bit, and um, we're going to talk about some of the more important parts of that. Uh, so I'm going to lead off with some generalizations in sealed. Sealed is usually slower which means you're usually going to be playing um, more expensive cards. And it also means that because you have less availability of total cards, remember in draft you have three packs and eight players, so it's more total packs than you just having the regular six packs. So while you might see six full packs instead of three packs where you have a first pick, you see total more cards in a draft than you do in seal which makes synergy-based decks better in draft because the cards that you want for your Devoid deck are coming to you while the cards for your opponent's Black-White Life Gain deck are going to them. So the cards are kind of naturally filtering themselves to the uh, players that are in the right signals or reading the right signals in the right seats. In Sealed, you're just stuck with what you have. So you're going to play less synergy decks. You're going to play more... You're going to lean more on your strong cards, your generic bombs, those kind of things. Um, what that means is in formats like Fate Reforged, you are depending a lot more on your bombs. What that means in sets like Battle for Zendikar is that colors that are normally bad, like people have been saying green is not a very good draft color. Some people have said it's unplayable, some people have just said it's bad, and that's true. It's not a great draft color because a lot of the commons are not very good, and the colors depend on its commons, and it's uncommons, and green uncommons and uncommons just don't line up that well overall. There's not a lot of depth, there's not enough green commons to make green worth going into consistently. But, in sealed, green is fine. Green is actually better than um, many of the other colors because it's less dependent on strategy. And by being less dependent on strategy, sorry, not strategy, it's less dependent on synergy. And being less dependent on synergy means that it has more just brute power cards. A uh, Brute Hunter Worm is an excellent example. Four for a 4-3 is the kind of card that you're excited to play in sealed, not because... Um, it's particularly better in sealed. It's that the synergy decks are worse. The Colossier uh, healer is just not doing the same kind of work it did before. It doesn't have the cards surrounding it that you drafted and chose the other kind of a eh cards on their own, but really good in this black white life gain deck. You don't have the choice to just pick those up across twenty four packs. Now you are basically just stuck with whatever the six packs give you. Um, the other thing about sealed that's important is realizing that you have usually modal uh, decks. You have a pool, and it has usually more than one mode. The last one we did, we had a, I think a Nye deck and an Esper deck. And being on the stream and talking about it does slow me down some, so it's not quite as quick on the deck building. I'll try to be a little bit more focused, a little bit quicker, so we can get to that. I don't think last time we had the optimal build that I'd like to start with, so we're going to try to get to the optimal build and talk about it a little bit more. Um, but you'll have more decisions to make, and the quicker and more efficient you are at limited, and then at sealed, will let you look at the multiple decks a little bit more time. You're always under that time constraint for sealed, uh, for any kind of limited format. But the more you practice sealed, the more you practice limited, get more familiar with it, the more you can weed out the cards you don't want to play. Some cards value goes up quite a bit in sealed as opposed to draft. Um, something like My Ears Malice which is a fine card to play in draft, although I will not always. It's a card I will always play in sealed. Uh, because people are looking to play slower, sealed plays about a turn and a half to turn slower than um, draft for the most part. And as such, slower cards are better. Cards that get rid of things in people's hands a little bit later are stronger. Um, people are more dependent on their bombs, so they'll do more to play those bombs. Oh, we only have three people joining. Give me one second, guys. All right. Um, let's see if we can pull up something here. To oh, ah, hey, run! There we go. That didn't work. Okay, that worked. 
So I want to highlight a couple of the cards that shine a little bit better in um, draft or sealed than draft that you should make a point of. One of the things to make a point of is green is a very good color in sealed. I mean, I'm not going to say it's top tier color, but it is a very playable color in sealed and not very good in draft. Whereas black, which is a fine color to go into into the uh, draft portion, is not a very good card in sealed or not a very good color in sealed, and that's just due to the uh, amount of synergy based cards in sealed. Now that'll change from sealed set to sealed set, although I don't think we've had a set in a long time where a color was unplayable because of its total card quality, which would make it also unplayable and sealed. Um, I think in M13 or 14, M13 I think white, or M14, white was very, very bad. M14, it was M14. But uh, we haven't had something like that in a long time. So here we go. We're going to look at Battle for Zendikar, and we're going to look at this by Rarity, because Rarity is really the only thing that matters. And I'm going to talk about a couple of the commons and uncommons that will go up or down, specifically based on sealed or draft. And we're going to talk about the cards that go from draft and whether they go down in draft, or whether from draft they go down in sealed, or from draft they go up in sealed, because we're about to open our sealed pool. Uh, we'll wait, now what? A couple more people? Yeah, we're just waiting for this phantom one to fire. And then in a minute, we're also going to talk about the uh, legendary cube. And I'm really excited for it. The EV for it is very good. And EV means estimated value or expected value, and um, we're going to be playing a lot of them. It's going to be a lot of fun. But, uh, so, cards like Kite Sail Scout, we're not going to talk about that, that's not really playable. Quarter Home Guide's a card that I would say would go up, because there's not really a blue allies deck that you're playing a lot, but in Sealed, if you end up in blue-green or blue in this other card, you want to have early drops, even though the format's slower, you still want two and three drops. This has a lot of utility late. It doesn't fit as well with the synergy-based decks. Every once and again, you do have it the synergy based deck that's blue allies or whatever but it's rare but the fact that um it's a two one for two is yeah but the big ability is pretty good in sealed that's the kind of thing you're looking for is uh mana sinks that make a difference um cards like Tish of the void remain the same they're still just as good as they were in one versus another uh the exiling effect is a little less good in sealed but that's not why you're playing the card you're playing the card for removal cards like nakana assassin however are going down now this is going to very high pick, so it's a, kind of a poor example of a card that you would play in draft that you won't play in sealed. Because for the same reason that you play this card in draft is you need a three drop and it does fills the void or it fills the hole. Same thing for sealed. But uh, let's see if we can find a better example. All these cards are fine. A card that goes up quite a bit is a card like Territorial Bailoff. This is not the kind of card I would normally play in draft. Um, Brett was a little higher on it. But I don't think that that's well-placed. I think that you should be quite low on a 5-mana 4-4 four four that doesn't do anything. Just attacks and other people's stuff. There's bigger colorless creatures. Uh, a 5-mana 6-6 six six is still not that good in this type of deck just because it's not really where you want to be at um, in draft. It doesn't have any synergies. It's The ramp deck doesn't really exist. It's just not an exciting card. But in Sealed, it's quite a bit better. And the reason it's quite a bit better in Sealed is that everyone doesn't have the access to those really powerful cards. Remember, a lot of the colors are very dependent on synergy, so they've lost a lot of their cards. You can easily open up a pack and half of, you know, you could have 16 cards in a color, uh, probably not green, so it'd be black, white, or something like that. Probably black, blue, or red, which have most of the synergy cards. And half the cards could be synergy cards, which makes them blanks for the deck because you can't build that synergy deck. Uh, Territorial Bailoff, ever doesn't have any synergies. Its synergies are punching. Simple, but effective. Um, another card that goes up a lot are good mana sinks, Valakut Invoker. Like I was saying with the Coral Home Guide, the Valakut Invoker holds the same position. You're going to play your curve. You need two and three drops for your curve so you don't get run over because sometimes people will have aggressive decks. But having a way to sink eight mana for an effective ability is very strong. Valakut Invoker is a fine card in draft. In draft, I don't pick it particularly highly, but at the same time, it's also not particularly low. It's somewhere, you know, on a rating from F to A, it's like a C plus or maybe a B minus, something like that. But in sealed, it's quite a bit higher. It's the kind of three drop that will help me survive early if I need it. And later in the game, it will win me the game. Um, I would probably rate it somewhere like a B to, you know, maybe even a B plus in um, sealed. It's significantly better because you're gonna go later. So the eight mana is much more realistic. 
uh, bone splinters. You're gonna play more cards like bone splinters. And draft, I won't always play this because my cards, my creatures, are usually better. I usually have to play a slightly lower caliber of creatures, but also I'm playing against more bombs. Your opponents are gonna play more big, splashy, strong creatures. Remember, instead of just opening the three packs and draft, where they might have three uh, really, really good bombs, they're going to instead be guaranteed to open six. Now they won't be able to play all six but they're more likely to see more strong rares. You're not going to pass the Guardian of Tazim in draft, but you have six chances to see a Guardian of Tazim in um, sealed. It's a little higher than three for draft, actually, since you're not, you know, in pack three, if you're green-red, you're not going to open a Guardian of Tazim and take it over a touch of the void. That's not the right pick, but you actually see more total rares. Um, Shatter Skull Recruit's about the same. Shear drops the kind of card that goes up just a little bit because your opponents are playing generally just more baseline cards. Being able to have direct answers is a little bit more powerful, but not significantly. I think flying is a lot better because the format is slower. Being able to get down a quick flyer, um, your, your opponent's usually playing more strong, big ground creatures in most formats. So playing your flyers can help. Uh, I don't think it goes up or down by a significant margin, but it is something to keep note of. Uh, white blue is one of the archetypes that is not mostly affected. It's mostly just the same deck in sealed or uh, draft, which is to its benefit quite a bit. Rune Hunter Worm is the best example for a card that gains a lot, right? So Battle for Zendikar is all about playing these cool synergy decks, doing things, whether you're playing the Black White Life Gain um, deck, maybe you're playing one of the Grixis Devoid decks, where Devoid is very important, Life Gain is very important. It's ally multicolor decks, where being an ally and ally trigger is very important. Or the red-white ally decks where the ally matters, all this stuff matters. And that's where green kind of gets pushed out, is that green doesn't have that many cards with strong synergies. And just a couple of <coughs> strong cards isn't going to push them enough in that direction to get there. But in sealed, you're in a situation... Excuse me. In sealed, you're in a situation where people don't... Oh don't have access to that level of uh, synergistic builds, so those synergy cards aren't playable, and just the big creatures, ah, like that guy right there, get a lot better. The Brood Hunter Worm is doing a lot more for us in a sea of cards that aren't synergistic. Green gets to shine with it just being a big creature. Just a 4-mana four 4-3 four, is usually a very good card in most limited formats. Think back to Origins, think back to Khan, or think back to Origins, think back to Dragons. This lags too much for me. Good to know. Are we having lag issues, guys? Am I having a lag issue? Yeah, with the, the stream. I don't think we were. No, I'm not having a lag issue. No. Uh, stuck, stuck net. Uh, hopefully we're not having lag issues anymore. Um, it looks like we're staying at a pretty steady uh, 30 FPS. But um, if you guys have more issues, just let me know. I didn't realize we were dropping frames. Like something at a lot. Alright, um, back to Brood Hunter Worm, sorry. The Brood Hunter Worm is kind of the litmus test for where you're at in this set. Most sets are not synergy based, so Brood Hunter Worm, Brood Hunter Worm would be good in draft or in sealed. But here we see the transition where it's just very strong in sealed. Let's keep going down. Um, cards like Feldar Cub are fine. Uh, they lose a little bit of value in that the aggressive decks are a little bit worse. They gain a little bit of value in that your opponents are more likely to have more premium removal. And I know that seems a little bit odd when I said you see less total cards in sealed, but you have a greater access. You're more dependent on your bombs, so you're more likely to pay, play your uh, enchantment base removal. And this gets rid of that, you know. Mostly a wash overall. Um, Isles Washer is fine. Most of these cards are just kind of in the same. You are more likely to play cards like Geyserfield, Stalker, Eyeless Watcher. And a lot of that just comes from the fact that, you know, let's say that you're building your sealed pool, and. Um, you have, you're playing black red, and you have a lot of really good cards, and they're the best colors, and you know you've got to play black red, but you count up the total playables, and you're sitting at 21, and you need at least one or two more for your deck's curve and how it's going to fill out. You know, you're sitting anywhere between 20, 21, 19. Well, guys are filled stock with going in the board. He's coming on in. He's working his way into your deck. Even though he's not a card I'd normally ever want to play, sometimes you have to take a quality dip on a couple of creatures to play two strong colors together. And sometimes you can just change that. You can play 
eight really good red cards, and then let's say that you have the other uh, 13 really good white, or okay white cards, they're, you know, they're all fine and serviceable, but they're not the world's best, you could put them together. All right, we'll see that a little bit here going into our sealed pool. All right, and we're gonna do this the way I like to do this, instead of the way Brad usually does this. So we've got our multicolor cards, which will be our tiebreakers in a minute. Two Ulumox Nullifiers and two Skyrider Elses. Pretty exciting, though. And this, we might be playing a lot of colors here, kids. Ooh. All right, let's first look at the colorless cards that are exciting. So let's sort this by rarity. All right, so we don't have any Mythics, but we do have quite a bit of rares. Um, Painful Truths is fine. Munda is fine. Marshall the Tomb is a little bit narrow. Guardian is great. Blight Hunter is fine. And Akum Helkai is fine. All right, well, let's sort by color. And we're going to go one color at a time and kind of see what we'd like to play. All right, so what I'm going to do is we'll come to our colorless cards in a minute. We're going to start with green. I'm going to put all the cards I'm excited to play in one pile. Um... Green is solid. There's nothing I'm too excited to play, but at the same time, there's nothing that's super awful. So we'll just set green over here. It is a good filler color. Let's red have us. I'm excited about this. The Hellkite, the Stone Fury. I'm neutral on the outnumbers. But I'm really down on a lot of these other cards. Kind of unfortunate that there's only two cards I'd really like to play there. Red is a consideration, but it's not a strong one. All right, what does black have for us that's really good? Painful Truce is a card I'd like to play. Drawing cards is nice. And the two Complete Disregards are also quite nice. But really, two Complete Disregards, a Bone Splinter, a Painful Truce, really all it's got offering for strong sway. And let's set these over here, too. What does Blue have for us? So I think Wave Wing Elemental is a totally uh, serviceable card for sealed. People often think about it because it's bad in draft that you wouldn't want to play it anywhere else, and you do consider it pretty playable there. Okay, so I've got two Clutch of Currents, a Guardian, a Tightening Coils. That looks okay. Um, blue looks like one of the stronger colors. We might end up just being in a position where um, the multicolor cards kind of send us over the top. All right, I like two Angels, I like a Smite. And that's it. Okay. So we don't have anything crazy, really. We have a bunch of pretty good cards. Let's see if we can do a little bit more with our colorless. We've got three scours. We've got a rune processor, which I think is pretty decent. Because it looks channeler, a blight herder, huh? Is there any way we could bleed blue, black, green? Do we have the mana fixing for that? Two evolving wilds, a fertile thicket. I think we're going to be blue, black, green. I want to play these Skyrider Elves. I want to play these Ulamogs Nullifiers. I want to play my good colorless cards. Pull on everything I want to play. See if I can make a deck out of that. Um, I think I might just splash black. What do I have in black that's real good? Complete Disregard. Ah. Complete Disregard. Malice Mire. Mire's Malice. I could run the grave birthings. I could return the retreat, maybe, but I don't know if it's worth it. Painful truths, bone splinters. Um, with the Ulamogs and Nullifiers, we can run the Mist Intruder, the Cloud Manta, the Cryptic Cruiser, the Incubator. High ends covered with the Wave Wings, the Clutches, the Tide Collar. There we go. All right, what does this deck look like? You know what, we might just be able to be two colors. We might not have to run these Sky Shroud Elves. We might just be blue-black. Look, we're in sort of cool synergy deck. That's unusual. And if we're just running two colors, we don't actually have to um, really run much else. Why wow, we can even make cuts here. This is a nice little pile here. Let's sort by converting mana cost. All right, so we have Two ways to get cards exiled. Three, four, five. Five easy ways to get a card exiled, which 
you know, I don't want to run the Mist Intriguer with two Ulamogs Nullifier. I think it's worth it. And the Rune Processor. This kind of sub-theme of Ingest is probably worth playing. Um, I'd like to make a couple of cuts here. Let's see. Well, I do want to run the Fertile Thicket and probably one other color just to make both uh, Painful Truth better, but also um, see what I can get. It needs to be a single color. Single color. So we could run white for angels and smites. We could run. We could run nothing and just have uh, painful trees for two, which is also fine. But with two evolving wilds and a fertile thicket, it's very easy to run a splash. Um, any wilds or thickets. So Adam is talking about green blue with uh, black splash, and I'm considering that too. I was actually looking forward to uh, rebuilding in a minute to see what other colors we can do because green has a lot of solid playables without anything being overly exciting. Um, we might either start green blue or blue black. Uh, I don't think red is particularly great, and I think white is also fine. Yeah, but white has a little bit more dependency on sort of spells, and that's not where I want to be at. Um, the Grave Birthing is more of a chump blocking thing here, but I think the power of the Ulamog's Nullifier is pushing me in that direction. But the green blue with the Sky Rider Elf and the uh, other green black cards is nice too. So we're going to start with the blue black and then we'll look at the green one too. All right. Um, so I think the cuts would be one less Wave Wing. I think we just run two less Wave Wings and something else. One Wave Wing is fine. With this many five and seven drops, we've got a lot of higher power. Uh, I like both Myers Malices to go with the two clutches. Maybe we just run one Myers Malice. Maybe this is what the deck looks like. When we run the Fertile Thicket, do we have a single green card that I want to run the Splash for? I could just Painful Truth for two. There's not really a need to run the Splash. Painful Truth for two is fine, by the way. And the one Fertile Thicket will let me get mana when I need to. I'll have basically just amazing mana. Yeah, green does offer a lot of early game power. Um, I think the format's slow enough that that's not as big of a deal. Um, we have... I don't think we'd need to use the clutches, but if we need to, we have two clutches, a tightening coils, the tide collar, two to complete disregards, and then two grave birthings to kind of buy us a turn. So that's eight cards. It's, it's pretty solid. Um, I'm going to add the mana, and I'll actually be back in one second. I'm going to use the restroom real quick, and then I'm going to look around at a little bit different decks, just like Adam said. Hey, Dubs. Dubs is one of the guys I uh, see every once and again. I'm actually about to jump to the restroom real quick. I'll be right back.
All right, sorry about that, guys. Um, so back to the drafting board. So, um, I think this is what it looks like for the blue black version. But we're gonna look at uh, Adam's black green, blue green version, and he's pointing out a big point, which is the nullifiers can be inconsistent, and that you won't always be able to get them to activate on countering. But the other part is, I think a 2-3 flying flash is pretty good. Uh, black brings a pretty good amount of control elements here. And um, this is a little bit slower build. But we're going to look at the blue-green or blue-black or green-black version real quick. So put all that away. Uh, we're going to leave the lands here just in case I... Actually, we don't need to run the fertile thicket for that one because the mana is so good. So the black-green... the Sorry. Actually, you know what? I'm going to move everything back. We have enough time. All right, and then we're going to sort by color. And that's a big thing about Seal, is looking at more than one deck, making sure that you explore all options. With Here we got two Skyriders. Um, in green, we've got the Invoker, the Stalwarts, which are good, natural, Void Attendant, Rune Hunter Worm. And looking at this, I think Adam actually might be right in that we want to run blue green over blue black we're kind of lucky here in that both of these are quite good um, the nice part of this is we don't have to run the mist intruder and I'm not sure if we want to run the um, ruin processor as a seven drop I think we actually are going to choose between the beast master and the wave wing do we have any thing that cares about allies, just the Beastmasters themselves. We could run one Wave Wing, one Beastmaster. Oh, we're already running a Wave Wing. All right, so we would want to make a cut somewhere here. These are actually two drops. So we could just run two colors. We could just not run black, although black is very easy to run due to the amount of colors we have and the amount of Convoke we have makes me want to run it, in which case we would run three uh, black cards, the strongest three right here. Um, we would probably not run the Ulamog's Nullifier unless we just wanted more flying, which we could then. And then we'd run three pieces of mana fixing. Um, and looking at this deck, I think that it has less of a high end, but it has a lot more early push. Um, and the Stalwarts being able to uh, be three fours early can count quite a bit. So I think we're actually going to start with um, the one Adam was talking with, the blue-green. This was the other one right here. Um, this was the other build. Right? And he's, he's pointing out we have a total of five Converge cards, and with uh, black, we're writing the Painful Truth as well to restock our hand, and it lets us do it very easily. The other thing is we have really good mana fixing with two Evolving Wilds and a Fertile Thicket. If we wanted to, when we sideboard, we have a lot of sideboard options. Um, we're going to start with this version. Let's see, I do not want to run Brilliant Spectrum. I do want to run Incubator Drone. I think these are all high quality cards. Now let's see where our cuts come in, because we actually have to make quite a few. We have quite a few great playables. I think this is actually the best build. We're going to cut the Wave Wing Elemental. I don't think we need and the Cloud Manta. The Cryptic Cruiser. We've got quite a bit of threes, and I'm happy with all of them. Now let's see, do we have a way to make cards get exiled? Because if we do not Void Attendant does not shine particularly strongly. Um, we've got the Unnatural Aggression and the Complete Disregards. So I'm not sure if we need another three mana card right there with so many already right here. Because the Skyrider Elf can be a two or a three drop. All right, so we need to make some more cuts. We could cut the Blight Herder. Um, it is a five mana four five, which I think is good. Adam likes the idea of the Manta over the um, the Worm, the 3-2 Flyer over the 4-3 Ground Guy. Um, it's definitely back and forth on that one, so he thinks that... So let's look a little bit more at the pool. These are tough cuts, and they're good cuts, because there's a lot of strong cards here. And Adam's making a good point, and the Brood Hunter Worm and um, Cloud Manta are both comparable cards. Rune Hunter Worm has a little bit more total power and toughness. It's going to be better at getting through, or it's going to be better at taking up the game, going up the game, all that stuff. But the other point is, you know, flying is very strong. How many flying cards do we have? One, two, 
three, so maybe the third flying card is better than another just strong ground card, which is another good point. We don't want to run too many four drops. We could cut the drone, but I enjoy the multiple bodies quite a bit. It's good with the two beast colors, which we have here. Um, so we need to cut off the top. The Blight Hunter has a much higher ceiling, but I think the floor on it is so much lower that I think that um, we're going to cut it, especially with us only having three single-use ways to get uh, cards exiled. It's going to be too hard to effectively use Blight Hunter, even though it is quite powerful as a... Uh, it's fine as a 4-5, or five, but we've, I think I'd rather have these four big drops. We still need to make more cuts, though, because I think I'm going to want to run 18 lands with the three colors. Um, I like all three of these black cards. They're good at any point in the game. I don't want to cut them, especially with us having this many options for uh, mana fixing. So we've got to make cuts somewhere, though. We could cut a Beastmaster. We might not need two of those. Uh, the Channeler's still fine. The four mana 4-4, four, four, or being able to play multiple spells. Both of them were great modes. Um. Where are we at? These are tough cuts. I think we do cut a Beastmaster. So now we need to make one more cut. I think we're actually going to run 17 lands with how good this mana fixing is. Although, I'm not sure if that's right. I've often been running 18. Mm. Maybe it's the... I See, the thing about the Eyeless Watcher is I like it with the Beastmasters. Maybe I do want to run two Beastmasters and the Eyeless Watcher. Maybe I cut the Eyeless Watcher and the Beastmasters sort of this package. Let's look at our creatures. Let's kind of throw all of our non-creature spells down here to make sure we're, uh, we're at where we want on creatures. And not cutting creatures when we shouldn't be. Uh, I mean, cut a lot of currents can be us creature. He's leaning towards the same card that I was thinking is the Incubator Drone. Where Incubator Drone, Eyeless Watcher, Beastmaster, all of these cards are making multiple bodies. Um, I'm not sure if I like the Eyeless Watcher and the Incubator Drone better. I think I like the 2 3 body better than I like the um, 3 1 1 bodies. But they're both fairly strong. Uh, we need to make these decisions quickly, though. Alright, I think I'm going to cut Eyeless Watcher, Beastmaster. Add basic lands. Let's go down to one swamp. Let's go up, up. Add the deck. That looks good. Let's submit it. Um, we'll talk more about the sideboard. Uh, needless to say, we have a lot of strong sideboarding options. Yeah. Uh, Adam's pointing out that uh, Incubator and Eyeless work better with multiple beasts as opposed to... Um, but since we're going with the one beast because I'm running the 17 lands, we're going to try a little bit leaner of a curve. We have a lot of mana sinks already kind of set up. The Marasa Ranger um, does good with extra mana. A couple other cards. Ooh, well, here we go. Next round. Uh, yeah. Ooh. So deciding we want to play or draw first is a big deal. Um, I don't think we're aggressive enough actually to want to... Uh, we have a pretty good curve, though. Yeah, we're going to play first. Usually drawing first is what you'd rather do. Um, we have two cards here. We need a third color to be able to play the Stalwart. But I don't think this is mulliganable. I think this is a keep. Adam, um, so Adam's pointing out what maybe two swamps for the higher converge chance. We have the Swamp, the Fertile Thicket, and then two um, Evolving Wilds. So we have four different cards that produce Swamp easily, and often we won't have to fetch for anything other than Swamps with the uh, really great mana we have. Opening two Evolving Wilds is quite nice, especially in such a light splash. That said, there is a chance that the numbers I'm looking at could be wrong, in which case we'll sideboard in a Swamp and sideboard out one of the lands we need less. Um, one of the tricky parts about having multiple sealed pools with a strict time limit is kind of figuring out exactly where it needs to be mana-wise and all these little nuances when you're looking at multiple decks. While we wait for opponent, though, I did want to mention uh, Dub's Plays is one of my buddies in real life. 
And Wednesdays, we've been playing um, games together. And we just started last Wednesday. We were playing uh, Yoshi's Wooly World. And a lot of it isn't as much as about playing games. This is talking about game design and sort of aesthetics and how to approach a game. Uh, Adam is pointing out that uh, the thicket has a lower chance to hit a single swamp than it does multiples. And that we can have our single swamp ingested away. And I did forget about the single swamp being ingested away. Um, it is an issue that you do need to recognize when you're playing this format. So I might end up running the second one if I play against ingest decks uh, specifically. Um, because you can't fertile thicket with an ingest creature on the field. Or your opponent can just ingest that land away. Um, but back to what I was saying with the depth wall, we're still waiting for our opponent to start the game with us. With this okay hand, we have two cards that we can play, and if we draw a land in any of the next few turns, we'll be able to play the all of the cards except for the Stalwart, and we have a fairly good chance. I think we had uh, nine forests, the Thirtle, Fertile Thicket, and two Evolving Wilds, so getting to the, sec the first green source should be pretty easy. Um, we have a... a fairly decent hand here. Although looking at this hand more does make me want to be on the draw because it's not especially aggressive. It just has a lot of solidly strong creatures power and toughness wise. And some decent tempo plays. Which tempo plays do play better on the draw than they or on the play than they do on the draw. But as I was saying to Demi and Debs, we uh, kind of talk about game design stuff, um, the small parts that make a game great or be, happen to be a game's downfall. And right now we're going to work our way through Yoshi's Wooly World and kind of talk about different game design aspects from level design to teaching the mechanics in a game, like how a game teaches you how to play the mechanics, all sorts of different stuff. But you can check us out on Wednesdays. Um, we usually do it Wednesdays around this time, 5 or 6 o'clock um, Central Time. So we should be doing that every Wednesday for a while. And then uh, me and Brad hopefully will start streaming uh, Monday, Tuesdays, and Thursday or Friday is here. Give me one second, guys. Let me take a peek down at my phone. Oh, I'm going to send messages. I'm seeing if Ash will join us. Uh, yeah. Man, our opponent's really taking their time here. Um, so let's talk about keeps versus plays and um, which one you would sort of tend to. Now in sealed you usually want to draw and a lot of that has to do with the fact that aggressive decks are worse. Um, I'm not sure if our decision was right to play or not here because I'm not sure if we're aggressive enough. Now the last sealed deck we had was, it was correct to, to play first because we were aggressive. Um, sometimes you just kind of get that aggressive one, and, and it works to your benefit a little bit. You are you would rather play, and your opponent will often let you play. Um, but the majority of the time, you're going to want to draw. The extra card means a lot more uh, getting all of your land drops, getting to be the first person on the six, which is more likely on the draw than the play because of the extra card, will set you up to be more successful. Fortunately, in our hand, you can see that our entire hand uh, just curves one to four, and it can curve you know, more realistically, two to five, because we'd rather not play Clutch of Currents on turn one if our opponent ever returns. They, they might just time out. We might just have the worst round one, um, which will make me really sad. We'll have a lot of time to fill in here. So let's go back to talking about what we were talking about before, because I think our opponent actually is going to time out. They time out after ten minutes. Unfortunately for us and for them, we did not get to play rounds of Magic. I'm of the opinion that I'm here to play Magic. I'm not here to uh, win virtual money and win virtual cards. I do enjoy winning. That is the goal. But the actual purpose for playing Magic is to play Magic and get better and have fun. Not really doing any of that while uh, Rourke here is stuck about to DC. Yeah, it's not us. It's them. I can send them a hello. Hello! Are you alive? Hopefully they're not in some sort of like terrible action movie, sort of fire kind of thing going on and their actual life is in jeopardy. that make me a big jerk. But um, let's get back to talking some of the cards and whether, how they go from draft, whether they go up and sealed or whether they drop down and sealed. 
while we wait for our opponent, hopefully, to return, or our next opponent. Now, we got to Geyserfield Stalker and talking about playing lower quality cards. We got really lucky here, as Adam was pointing out earlier, that uh, the quality of our pool was very high. We had the opportunity to make a strong blue black deck, a strong green blue deck, or a green blue splash deck for the Converge. We also had the option looking at it more. Uh, we could have made sort of the Anaya deck. We could have made a green, white, blue, or sorry, green, red, white deck. Uh, there was a lot of options with the level of mana fixing and solid playables we had. I think blue would have been in any of the decks due to the strength of the color. Black and green looked fine. White had a lot of good playables that I considered as well. Red didn't have a lot of strong playables, but it did have a few powerful cards that we could move towards um, if that was the need to. And a couple of pretty strong splashable cards too. Like I couldn't see a situation where playing green, red, white and we were running sort of the uh, splashable red, white ally and some of the splashable red mo removal stuff, which usually isn't super splashable. When you have three good pieces of uh, mana fixing, it makes it a lot easier. But back to back to our task. Um, combat tricks are about the same position they are from sealed and draft. Usually they drop just slightly because uh, your opponents, because you have a less synergistic attack, you aren't taking advantage of being on the attacking as well. You know, usually combat tricks go more aggressive decks because they're more effective there. As Adam pointed out, flying can be stronger. Um, I do prefer to have an all-flying deck because your opponent is going to be playing big, kind of dumb, dirtily strong creatures. But in our blue-green deck, we had a lot of good ground creatures, so playing something like Cloud Mana to reach over the top is a lot stronger. Even though we're trading a 3-2 flying for a 4-3 ground guy. <clears throat> And speaking of kind of dirtly guys, Beastmaster, just being a 5-5 five five is usually fine. Like, you know, often in draft you're playing him for his ally text of him coming to battlefield, pumping your team. You know, that guy is really helping out finish everything off. But um, just being a 5-5 five five is fine. Uh, we talked about the 7-mana uh, oh, 7-8 the seven mana seven eight and the processing and life and all that. And we didn't end up playing him because we didn't have to and because um, we had a slicker curve in the deck we played, but in the blue-black deck I was considered playing him heavily because just being a 7-8, whether or not you get an ingest or not, means quite a bit. Uh, Clutch of Current is actually a card I think that gets a little bit worse in Sealed. Uh, it's just because you can't take advantage of the tempo quite as well. It goes more turns, which means tempo cards are slightly worse, but not significantly. I would still always play it. Ditto for Merch Strider. Claustro, Night Watch, and Merch Strider other cards that are going to drop some because you're not going to have the ways to kind of get them going off as well. Colossia Night Watch will usually just be a 5 mana 4 5, which is fine to play. You know, don't don't mistake it as a bad card. And Merch Strider is a 3 2 for 4. It's not something you want to play. But if you have, you know, a couple Benthic Infiltrators, it's fine to play that as well. But sometimes you won't. And then this card's not really a card you'd rather play. Just playing a, three, a 4 mana 3 2 is not very good. Um, aggressive cards can be worse too, unless you get enough of them. Because without enough aggressive cards, you're not going to be able to push through enough damage for it to matter. Having just a couple of three three ones, you know, just having not having that sort of threshold of enough early drops and enough aggression means that you'll have to rely on other ways to get through other big creatures. You can't do that with a deck that just plays some threes, two threes, and four to five. You can't play three three. 3-2 drops, 3-3 three, three drops, 3-4 three, drops, 3-5 three, drops, because that's not a real curve. Now, if you have a real curve with like 2 drops, a bunch of 2 drops and stuff, it will work, but that's a little bit rarer in this case. Um, let's see if our opponent... Okay, yeah, we just won the match. Our opponent DC'd. I guess they were unhappy with their sealed pool. Um, when you're playing matches like this, even though there's not a high cost to uh, starting another match, there is a lot of value in practicing sort of low power pools. Uh, LSV recently did quite well with a low power pool at uh, GP Atlanta. He took a low power pool and he managed to get to day two and he managed to go 12 and three with it. And that comes from practice and that comes from understanding the potential of your pool. Even if it looks bad, trying to play through it, trying to find the best value, trying to find the best way to make that work. Remember that your sealed deck is multiple decks so you have multiple decks to transform into later. So maybe you have three terrible decks. Well, maybe, you know, terrible deck A, the one you start with, matches up kind of poorly most of the time, but sometimes okay. And B and C match up even less often well, 
but they have certain decks that they beat pretty well. You can sideboard into those decks, as need be, to hopefully capitalize on your opponent staying with one deck that's stronger than your first deck, and probably stronger than any of your decks, but weaker than a specific deck. Sort of a, you know, rock, paper, scissors feeling. Paper is definitely the weakest material there, but the fact of the matter is paper beats rock, which, while stronger and objectively better material-wise, you know, in the real world, but in the metaphor kind of in the same way here, sometimes your bad deck will beat a better deck because it's positioned better. We have a lot of downtime, by the way, guys. Look at me talking about all these cards. I stretch on my jaw. Um, yeah. Cards like Mantis Rider are about the same. Green's a little bit more playable. General cards like this kind of just go up in value because their synergy cards are worse. Cards like Sky Spawner still stay pretty much the same in draft, which is quite good. Uh, just being a flyer. Making multiple bodies. All the stuff that applies in draft applies in seal here. Cards like Plummet retain, retain their value as well. Remember, strong sideboard cards. Um, you'll have less access to more sideboard cards. So making use of the sideboard cards you do have is a bigger deal as well. Cards like Vestige of Miracle, which are fine but not great in draft, become a little bit better because, you know, this technically is a synergy card, but you don't pick it up highly for your synergy decks. You'd rather have a lot of other synergy cards in your Devoid deck. But the Vestige pushes upward in Sealed because just like the uh, Broodhunter Worm, it's a 4-mana four 4-3. Four, in this case, it's a 4-mana three, 3-4 four four with Trample. Um, complete Disregard says mostly the same. Removal's still great. Smite the Monsters goes up some, though. Your opponent's going to be playing a slower deck in general, which means you're not usually going to run into the decks that don't run targets for this. Most decks will have one or two targets at the very least, but often have many more targets because they're going to be expecting more big creatures and because they have a less realistic expectation of playing a real low ground curve. So Smite definitely goes up quite a bit. Not a card I'm excited to run more than one of, or even one of in draft if I can avoid it, but in seal I'm always happy to run probably two, and I might even run three depending on how my pool looked. Miss Intruder takes a nosedive. A lot of that has to do with the fact that um, cards that are heavily synergy-based don't really have anything to go with them. Mm. Now, our pool, we would welcome a couple of Mist Intruders because we have a lot of um, sort of cards that could play well with that. We had a lot of process cards to go with it. Would have been great if we had enough sort of ingest cards to go uh, with this, whether it was a couple more Mist Intruders or Benthic Infiltrators. We didn't. So we didn't hit the whole threshold, so it's low on us, and it'll be low in most decks. You'll either not have enough ingesters or enough processors on average. Removal overall is still quite good. Um, it stays pretty level. Remember we talked before about combat tricks dipping slightly because aggressive decks are harder to get to, and um, combat tricks tend to be better in aggressive decks than in more expensive decks. Cards like this, ramping cards, mana fixing cards, um, can go up a little bit. And the reason is you're uh, more likely to be in a situation to need to play more colors. Um, often you won't have a great pool like cards and you'll be forced to play two, three colors, sometimes four colors, and the green base can be a lot stronger then. <coughs> Bless me. Uh, this weather's catching up to me, guys. Cards like Metal Drone still strong, even though um, this is a synergy-based card, and it is better in a synergy-based deck. It's still fine here. It's still doing good work. The pinging is still relevant. The game going longer makes that effect even stronger. Cards like Culling Drone are already bad in draft, become even worse in the sealed format. Just you don't need two drops that don't do a lot. Your opponent's more likely to have um, good three and four drops to play. To sort of cut this kind of card off. Ooh. Cards like Eldrazi Devastator, however, go up because you will have more access to more mana. Over time, you're going to reach later turns um, on the whole, so a card that's stronger later is going to perform better for you. Being able to play an Eldrazi Devastator consistently means that it can be a more reliable plan. Most decks won't be able to kill you before you get there. Be aware that Eldrazi Devastator is like, you know, you're going to normally play it on turn 10 to uh, 12. 
you're not only going to hit eight land drops in a row, but the games go that much longer um, very frequently, especially if your deck has any way to sort of slow the game down or accelerate towards that goal. Ditto for Ruin Processor. I consider Ruin Processor better than Devastator in both draft and sealed, um, just because costing one less for one less of stats is a really big deal at this mana cost. Ooh. Uh, the better the ability on Ruin Processor is better for keeping you alive. Uh, it's better for any of the game on Eldrazi the Devastator, but that's not the important part. The casting cost is. I would say that playing Ruin Processor without any ingesters is actually completely serviceable if you need a big top end finisher. I'd rather run the processor than I would the dro the Devastator. Warpaint's another card I'm still not really willing to play that much. If you have to play it. It still does what you hope it to do, but remember, you can't get blown out with combat tricks. That's still a big deal in Sealed. It doesn't change anything for that. Healer is one of those cards that takes a steep nosedive. It's hard to have the sort of um, concentration you need to make synergy decks work. So there's not a lot of space for just a 2-mana 1-2. Now, if you open a pool with two of these and some black-white allies to go with it, then yeah, sure. Sign it up. Get it going, you know, if you've got the payoff cards. But usually you will not. Uh, you know, cards like Incubator Joan, stay in level. Oof. Cards like Lava Step Raider are still quite low. I think it would be lower in sealed than draft, but you can't really go lower. So, you know, it's still that low. Salvage Drone, a card that you may very rarely play in draft, but probably shouldn't, is a card you will never play in sealed. Simple. Life Spring Druid goes up some, mana fixing is a little bit better, um, and utility drops. Uh, early utility drops are also better in sealed just because you don't usually get to run a lot of them so if you are only running a few the few you're running having more than one use makes them even stronger Courier Griffin um, I think it's mostly level the fact that it's a 2-3 means less in sealed because it'll be playing bigger creatures the fact that it has flying means more in sealed because uh, the game goes longer so the flying means that you have more turns to get through small amounts of damage Cards like Oracle of Dust are a lot better. Because you're almost guaranteed to be able to play your 5 drops. Because the game will almost always go to turn 6 or 7. And it being a 3-5 like holds up the ground quite a bit. Also these reusable um, processing effects I like quite a bit more in Sealed than Draft. In Draft you can usually use, uh, I'm going to call them On Demand, but it's when you cast them or they enter the battlefield ones. Process The On Demand process effects, because you usually have the adjust cards to do it immediately. But in your sealed deck, you may only have one or two benthic infiltrators or one mist intruder or something else. And being able to use these reusable effects means that you can use uh, your exiled card later in the game. And being able to use your exiled card later in the game when you please uh, or when you have those resources available makes it quite a bit stronger. I've got another message coming in. Give me a second, guys. All right, um, Wave Wing Elemental is a card that goes up quite a bit. And a lot of Wave Wing Elementals increase comes to the fact that the format is slower, so you're more likely to be able to trigger the landfall and get through more times, right? Um, even if it's only a turn or a turn and a half slower, that is another draw. That's essentially another land to another two lands on average. And that means quite a bit more for Wave Wing Elemental. That's essentially giving it another two points of power throughout the whole game. And, you know... Creating a 5-6 as opposed to a 3-4 on the average of the game is what really sets this card off from being mediocre to quite strong. Um, not a card I'd like to run in draft. A card I'm pretty happy about running in sealed. And in fact, in many of our matches, we will sideboard into Wave Wing Elemental and ones where we're trying to trade a lot of creatures and the uh, ally overrun ability doesn't mean as much or where uh, we're kind of, the ground is kind of stalling out. Wave Wing Elementals will come in over the uh, Beastmasters. Medic is a synergy-based card. It's dropping in value. <sighs> Scour from Existence, however, is shooting up pretty well in that you need removal to answer their bombs. This answers anything in the game, and, uh, or anything in the format, at least. And the cost is less of a consideration than in draft. So it's another card that's kind of pushing you towards a stronger position. 
the channeler is kind of in that same position. You wanting more mana, you needing more mana, getting five drops more. It's a good card. Seek the Wilds is a card I'm more willing to play. You're playing more colors. You're seeking more specific big creatures. Um, you're even less likely to be able to have stuff to do with your mana early. And all that kind of works together to create a situation where you want to play um, more two drops that do stuff. And this does something early, does something late. It's not extremely proactive in that you're not putting something onto the board immediately. But it's letting you fix your colors in your three-color deck. It's letting you attack through, or sorry, get creatures to attack with. Um, let's not draw this time. <laughs> this is a serviceable hand. I've got a three-drop. So two-three, it's not exciting, but it's fine. Um, yeah, let's keep. All right, let's start with our island. And we will be going two drop into three drop. Or sorry, three drop into four drop, regardless of whether stuff we drop. Okay, well we're gonna go two drop into three drop into four drop. And put on a kind of aggressive curve here. And um, if we draw lands, Clutch of Currents can act as a 5-drop. And if we don't, then um, Clutch of Currents can bounce something or act in that capacity. That looks like our opponent's playing the same colors. Fathom Feeder, quite powerful. Alright, let's go ahead and attack. And then we'll go ahead and drop Forest. And we will opt to offer a trade here if our opponent attacks. We could, you know, play the incubator drone, all that kind of stuff. Um, but I don't think our opponent's going to attack offering for a trade of 1-1 uh, versus 1-1. One, one. And I'd like to get the Fathom Feeder off the board before they start paying 5 mana to draw more cards. If I was my opponent, I would not attack. I would consider just waiting. All right. Yep. All right, we'll play the fourth land, and we'll attack with both again. And our opponent can trade two of their creatures for ours. If they do not, we will play an incubated drone. And now we're in a position where we can kind of keep control of the game using tempo spells. We have two clutch of currents. If we draw a land, we'll be able to awaken those lands. If we draw a swamp, we can play a 3 3 flyer. If we draw just any land, we can play Taruju Beastmaster as we see fit. Our opponent's going to really need something to kind of stabilize the board here. Sacrificing a sign usually means something like that. Um, we'll probably eventually bounce our own guy with Clutch. I really like the Fathom Feeder Void Attendant combo here. Alright, so let's go ahead and... Oh, we can't play Complete Disregard. Let's play another Skyrider Elf, I guess. Play that for two... Okay. Um, then we can attack with all of these creatures and keep back our 2 2. Yeah. We could clutch our Skyrider so we have something next to do. Let's attack first. We're going to go ahead and attack with both of these creatures. Our opponent can double block Void Attendant Eldrazi Scion. Yeah. Which I'm fine with. And let's go ahead and Clutch of Current our Skyrider Elf. 
which is not particularly exciting, but for it for now. And if our opponent attacks, we'll probably just let the attack go through. Um, I would trade the Fathom Feeder for the Eldrazi Sign, but the Void Attendant I would not. They don't have anything exiled, so that's just a 4 mana 3 2. Like we said before, not particularly exciting. Alright, we drew a forest here. Um, so we can Clutch of Currents, bounce a creature, and attack with all of our creatures. I'm not sure how much that sort of adds to anything, particularly. I think I'm actually just going to play the Skyrider Elf for two and attack with my two two threes. Let's go ahead and attack with the two two threes, though. Actually, we're just going to attack with the... F yeah, we'll attack with both. I'm fine trading this uh, stalwart for any of the cards available. My opponent's fine trading his 3 2 for my 2 3. And I think I'll. Yeah. Well. Now let's go ahead and have our Clutch of Currents awakened. Let's return their Devoid creature. We'll target our forest. And we'll tap three. Brad has rejoined us. Brad, we won the first round by our opponent not doing anything for 10 Woo. minutes. It was real boring. We had people watching us. They left eventually. That's funny. <laughs> yeah. That's why people do a Q, Danny. Yeah, Brad's saying we should uh, quad Q. Quattro Quoosh. All right, our opponent doesn't have good attacks here again. They can attack with the Void Attendant, but they're really in a position where they need to uh, get something going, and they're not in a position to do that very well. Now, we could play them Unnatural Aggression here and have our 3-3 kill their 2-3... I kind of like that play. They can block with the Fathom Feeder to kill our forest, but they could do that before anyway. Uh, let's go ahead and do that. Drag control. Creature my opponent controls. And we'll leave blue open. It worked great. And we'll attack with everything and let our opponent begin to devoid and ingest. And our opponent was willing to trade their Fathom Feeder finally for that because of their death's door. Fathom Feeder was one of their best ways to kind of get out of this, but they had to keep waiting. Oh, looks like they have something good. 5-5 five, five in this one is strong. We'll play for it. We'll pick it. Let's yield yes to it. Hmm... Put that on top of my library. Hopefully our opponent doesn't adjust that away. And then we're going to play our elf for two. And attack with our 2-2 two -two flying. Alright. Now our opponent can attack us for five, but I don't think it's a good idea being that they are at five. Um... So I'm assuming my opponent's not going to attack here. We're going to play our land, play our Beastmaster, and attack with 2 3, three flying. It should end the game. But if it does not, we have a Beastmaster, which rumbles quite well with this endless one. All right, now I assume our opponent's playing something that matters this turn then. Because attacking the 5-5 five, five into lethal does not make a lot of sense. So our opponent will probably play something. Sounds fine to me. No reason to jump block more at 20. All right, our opponent has a way to kill a creature, which is fine. They will have to kill one of our Skyrider Elves, which I assume they can do. And we're going to attack for a bunch of damage. And I think our opponent is dead if they have a single removal spell, which is what they kind of hinted at. 
Right. Grave of Desolation was not the card they wanted to play because they're still dead. All right, so our opponent is playing some sort of blue-black-green kind of cool deck like ours. It uh, looks like they're a little bit more all-in on ingesting, so we're going to drop... One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, eight. We're eight and eight. Let's go ahead and drop a forest and add a basic swamp. So that way they can't be added just to the easily. I don't think there's anything else we'd like to do with our opponent playing sort of a wider strategy, like a, sort of a trickier strategy. Is there anything I don't think will do that well? Um, they could have some bounce. What are cards I don't like against bounce? I think it's just Marasa Ranger. I don't mind it that much. Would I rather have another Beastmaster? Looks like they had a lot of two threes, so maybe Orn Reef Invoker's not quite where I want to be at. Um, Maybe I drop an Orin Reef Invoker and pull in either a Myers Malice or a Wave Wing. There's a lot of cards you can pull in here. But with our card have, opponent having slower cards, I do like the uh, Myers Malice. I don't like the Unnatural Aggression quite as much with the Death Touch, so let's go ahead and try um, two Myers Malice. This kind of takes us off of a lot of removal. But it should cause our opponent not to be able to um, play as many cheap spells. So let's give this a go. Or do we want to play more threats? We could play a wave wing. 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 We didn't see anything to reclaiming vines or plummet. I think I'd rather have the cheaper card. Well, I do like having creatures. Could kind of shift over to a more expensive, more bodies version. Alright, let's try more bodies. We could change colors and do that kind of shift, but I do really like having the um, the power of the converged cards. And with the amount of mana fix we have, I think that, that power is too hard to pass up. Uh, another good hand, two drops, three drops, four drops. Let's go ahead and keep this. If our opponent's playing first, that's also going to play well for us. Do not think their deck plays first well. Uh, if they had a sledge crawler here, that would make a lot. That would make a strong play. Okay. So we have a goal now. Get out Guardian. Uh, we're going to play the turn 2 Skyrider into the turn 3 Tyru uh, Stalwart. Just like last time. Uh, two mana, two two is fine with flying. Puts our opponent under a lot of pressure to answer it. Gets rid of things like Mist Intruder, Sunken Hollow. That's a nice card for them. All right, let's go ahead and go to combat. See if they answer. They do not. Let's drop our second forest. Throw down our stalwart. And the good news with that fourth land drop is it means we hit the Marasa Ranger, and our opponent will basically be in a position where they've really got to start kind of putting something out. I mean, we're on turn three, and we have three things, and they're playing their first spell on turn four, and it's a Titan's Coil, which is okay. I wouldn't consider it great, though. Not to our turn five Guardian of Tazim and to Kozilek's Channeler. Probably should have attacked before playing that. Definitely should have. Uh, let's on the attack with the Sky Rider. Uh, there's not really any hasty creatures in these colors, but no reason to tap out when you don't need to. And our opponent's under a lot of pressure, and we have a nice curve again. So, let's see what our opponent. Oh, 
All right, so Reclaimer is another one of those cards I like quite a bit. It's just kind of big. Um, now, it doesn't stop us, per se. I could pay five and make this a five five. But I'd rather have a diverse base of threats. So we're not going to play for that. We are going to attack with both of our creatures. Our opponent can block one. And they'll take two. No, they chose to choose three. Interesting. All right, well, we're going to prevent our opponent from doing a lot of blocking. We play our island, and we'll tap down their reclaimer. And we'll play our channeler. Or we could just pump up the uh, ranger. Oh, Deathless Behemoth. That's a good one. Island. Okay. I think we will. Yeah. We will pay for this. All right. We'll attack with all our creatures, hold back. We didn't have to attack with the Stalwart, but, um, wow, my opponent chose not to block. I guess they were frustrated. Looks like this match is going to end quite soon, too. Um, our opponent's Fathom Feeder is not going to be enough here. They exile the forest. We got the GG. Island seals it up. Man, that was a quick match. All right, let's go back into um, kind of talking about where we're at for the various kinds of cards, whether they're up and down on sealed or draft. Here, um, we got to Seek the Wilds, which I do think is up because of the reasons I talked about before, mana fixing, wanting to be able to get to your powerful cards more consistently. Seek the Wilds is both of those. Grave the Birthing's down because it's a synergy-based card and you're less likely to need those. And the overall impact of you having, or the overall likelihood of you having the processor cards you need is lower as well. Spell Shovel I'm up on. Counter Shield is a better and Sealed. Your opponents are going to play more powerful spells. And even though it is a conditional one that says four, four is a lot of mana. You can counter a six drop. And if your opponent doesn't have ten lands, they will not only have ten lands. And you can counter six, seven, eight drops. Your opponents will be playing all of these things. Spell Shovel will be very consistent counter spell for all of those things. So the power of counter spells definitely goes up when you have more time. Great Horn is one of those cards that uh, doesn't have a home because it's not really a synergy based card, but it goes up because you don't need synergy. Slide Runner kind of goes down just a little bit just because there's less aggressive overall decks. I would still be happy to run it. You do need two drops. This one attacks better than it blocks, which is fine. <laughs> Discard. Mindraker, Myers Malice goes up and sealed because your opponent's playing more cards. It means they're more likely to have a card in hand when it's time to play one of these cards. The Mindraker doesn't go up quite a bit because you don't normally have as many ingest cards. It's a little harder to take advantage of that. You want to use the last card, etc., etc., etc. But Myers Malice goes up quite a bit because of the... Um, power level of discarding two cards. Remember, if your opponent has a bomb that costs seven and two lands in hand, and they have five lands on the board, it was going to come out in two turns. You play Myers Malice, they're going to draw a land every other turn roughly, but it's a little less than that, so they'll draw probably two lands over five turns. You likely bought yourself those five turns, sometimes more. Sometimes your opponent doesn't hit the exact statistical average amount of lands in a row, and it's more likely than not that they will not, so it's five plus turns usually bought by Myers Malice for whatever drop that they're on. So if they're on five mana, you just told them that they can't play seven drops for another four or five turns at the very least usually. Such Caller is a card that would go down for Devoid, but it actually goes up quite a bit because the um, paying two plus one plus one ability becomes even more powerful. And it counts, like, it counts for quite a bit more. 
um, having that extra power and toughness whenever you need it. Alter's Reap's a card I'm more likely to play just because I want more cards. Um, your playable count dips down, so cards like Alter's Reap, which were uh, borderline before, move right above that. Rails Mage's Trick is the kind of card that also goes up just a little bit because of um, the likelihood of stall out boards, of you and your opponent both building up boards and kind of staring at each other, increases. So cards that can be used offensively or defensively to kind of break those stalls also makes them stronger cards as well. Remember guys, we're still waiting for our next round. Um, results may vary and Malice are taking a minute there. Um... And I think that that's the only person that we're waiting on. Yeah, it looks like everyone else is done. So we're just waiting on one more person. I guess we're going to be rooting for the person that has the better record there so they finish up quicker so we can get on to the next round. And see if we can find the 3-0 an event. Um, I've had some poor some poor play and some poor luck with uh, this set overall. I haven't had a 3-0 in a minute. Anticipate, just like we talked about with Seek the Wild, it's a card that's going to go up in your estimation. You want more cards to play on two. You're less likely to have cards to play on two. And this card's going to dig you to the cards you need, uh, which you will have less overall synergy-based cards and more specific bombs and answers. Angelic Gift is a card that I don't want to play as much, but it's about even because of um, the cantripping effect. But just general auras, I think, are down. Infiltrator's about the same. Um, even though you can't use the ingest quite as often, the fact that it's still very strong stands. <laughs> Hold steady. What tells a card that goes up quite a bit? Because of uh, it not being a synergy-based card, it fell in the kind of draft standings um, from where we initially saw it. But in Sealed, just playing a 4-mana four 4-2 four that attacks with first strike some of the, about half of the time is quite powerful. It's going to get you a decent bit of damage through, and if it gets through four to eight damage before trading with something, it was a very good card. It was a good investment of four mana. Blister Pod, I don't really want to play this in Sealed. Um, it's a very synergy-based card. I know it looks like it's going to block well and buy, make you a mana, but more often than not, it just terribly buys you a turn and terribly makes you a mana at the cost of a card, and that's a high cost. I do not want to play a Lotus Petal in um, Sealed. Champion goes up, just like Brood Hunter Worm. Same for the patrol, right? The fact that these allies mean less, but the fact that they're solid stats at the mana cost means more. Just general removal like Demon's Grasp is very good. If our opponent had this Demon Grasp in our games, they could have done a lot more. They could have gotten rid of um, our threatening cards. A lot of the cards are answered by Demon's Grasp in this set, so it's a very valuable card to have in your sealed pool. Just a couple pieces of unconditional removal, or mostly unconditional removal. Boiling Earth is still a strong one of to play. There's enough one toughness creatures in this format that it's good to main deck one in seal or draft. Um, in draft, you can often move to two, uh, one on to your another one to your from your board out because you're more likely to hit that seven mana cost. So the cost of it being bad when your opponent doesn't have any one drops means less, and you can more often have a seven mana four four, which is a terrible rate, but it's fine when the card's primary purpose is to kill things. Ghostly Sentinel. Goes up, basic card, basic functions, base power level, all worth more. Call of the Scions. I, so ramp deck is the one deck that's not as much of an archetype importance in sealed because you're being playing more expensive cards, so I don't mind playing something like Call of the Scions. I'm not going to rate it highly, I'm not going to play it highly, but I can play it more often than you would think of other synergy cards because just playing more expensive stuff is a general you're going to be able to do archetype more than a, a specified archetype. In draft, you have to get to seven mana or eight mana before a certain number of turns before your opponent kills you because the game's going to last a short amount of turns, but it's still that lasts a little longer, so your ramp decks are a little bit, given a little bit more leeway than they were before is probably the best way to put it. Fertile Thicket, still strong, fixes your mana well, and you're going to be playing more colors, it's going to do better. Uh, let's go ahead and pass on the cards and arms good. Cards like Cliffside Lookout, which are cards you're not normally going to play in Sealed, that you might play in Draft in the Synergy deck. So, you know, you're down on those. 
it's a little harder to play the, the come to play tap lands. Now, the plus side to them is that um, you don't have to make picks over them, right? So when they come in, they'll come to you. The downs and that your curve is usually a little bit higher. So you have less of an onus to be able to play them early so you can play your immediate drops. Um, the downside is you're often running more colors, so it can be harder to fit them in slots. You do need a certain amount of untapped lands. But I'll, I'll usually run the ones that I can find. Um, if it fits in with my deck's theme, and I think all of them are pretty good. Uh, we could be running the uh, Mortuary Mire, but the reason we're not is that we need the two swaps for the uh, two fetch, for the two um, Evolving Wilds. Cards like Tightning Coils remain level, Horn Reef Invoker going up, two drop with high utility. High utility two drops are much better in sealed than they are in draft, just because you're more likely to reach that high utility. Um, Cards like Outnumber usually go up in draft two. Your opponent only has a certain amount of removal. They have to keep it for your bombs. So they're unlikely to remove all your small cards. So Outnumber can do a little bit more work, but not a significant amount of more work. Earth and Arms, I'm a little hotter on it. It's a little better in sealed than draft, but not significant. Cards like Dom, Gideon's Reproach are still high. You might think, well, if they're going to play bigger cards, what about... Do I have to answer four fours, etc., etc.? Most of the creatures are going to have four or less toughness. It's the kind of card you still want to answer. run. Sure, they might have two, three, maybe even four cards that don't die to it. But for the most part, almost all their cards are going to die to Gideon's Approach. Keep running them. Fortified Rampart was a card that you played a lot in your blue-white skies decks. You will usually only play it if you have a decent amount of evasion. It's not the best thing to play unless you either need the game to go very long or you have ways to fly over. Now, if I was playing some sort of, you know white blue or white black sort of deck with a bunch of really high end um, colorless Eldrazi type cards or other big white and blue bombs I could see myself running fortified ramparts even if they are ground creatures because they'll be able to kind of get through the ground but it's a lot better with flyers reckless cohort goes down quite a bit not as much synergy two drops mean a little bit less all that put together puts it on a much lower level uh, snapping gnarly doesn't drop quite as much as something like reckless cohort because it can you know be a 3-3 three, three, which means a lot more than a 2-2 in this format, and it can attack a lot better and block a lot better. Combat tricks drop some, but, you know, Tandem Tactics is still a top-tier level combat trick, so I would continue to pick it fairly, or I'd continue to play it fairly often. If I played white, I would play one, um, maybe even two. Predator attacking as a 4-4 is great. Blocking as a 2-2, not quite as much, but usually if you're in colors like red and sealed, it's still going to be aggressive. Um... Whether a deck is aggressive or defensive rarely changes from sealed to draft, just because the cards themselves are printed in a way to be aggressive or defensive for the most part. Cards like Build Up Brilliant Spectrum go up a little bit. I chose not to play mine because I didn't have to. Um, but just cards that are this kind of mediocre cards that get better in multiple colors or the longer the game goes will be better because you'll play more colors and the games will go longer. Silent Skimmer, another card that's going to go up some. Just because it's evasive. That's cool. um, get in. Still a cool card, dudes. Um, Ulamog is more playable because it's easier to get to 10 mana, but remember you still need to make a plan to get to 10 mana. We've played several games of Seal. We've only gotten to 10 mana a couple times. Don't just put this into any deck and expect it to perform. Build a deck that either slows down the game long enough for you to get over half your lands. That's a lot of lands, guys. You need to be playing card draw or ramp or something to get there. You have Eldrazi Science, you have card draw, you have traditional ramp, whether it's through creatures or getting more lands. You've got to do one of those things. You can't expect to go through over half your deck to play one card. Uh, cards like Drana and Obnixilis are still obviously extremely good. Cards like Oblivion Sober are even better in sealed than in draft and they're all start in draft. Ditto for cards like Kiora, Quarantine Filled, you know, cards like pa Parts of Waterbell, cards that I'm kind of meh on in draft, because although they have the power level, the cost is kind of excessive, they go up because I'm more likely to be able to pay that cost to get that power. Mm. Cards like Dragon Master Outcast go up in some ways too, and that you're more likely to be able to splash for a rumor Dragon Master Outcast is more of a six drop than it is one drop. Um, and the green cards, like Undergrowth Champion and Green Warden Morasa, which are extremely powerful, and I would love to first pick in draft, although you can be hesitant and reasonably pick in a worse uncommon of another color, 
because green is so hit and miss, so hot and cold, so flaky in your sealed pool, you'll know if it's good or not. And if you have these cards, you should look to making towards that deck if you have the cards to support it. Big good cards are still good and big. Um, let's see if we can find any cards of significant difference. We're in the rares now, so things are a little bit overall different. I do feel like cards like Planar Outwist are better in um, sealed and draft because your opponent's likely to play more cards and uh, more creatures to match yours or to get around yours, and you can often get more value out of a card like this because the deck's going slower. You can sort of set it up to take more advantage of the strengths of playing it outburst. Also, when you're building a sealed pool, let's say that you're playing a green red deck and you're deciding if you want to splash blue or you want to splash black. Often, using things like Lumbering Falls or just two color lands like Sunken Hollow or something like that is a great way to make that decision. Um, the easier it is on your mana base, the stronger consideration it should be to play that color. One of the heavy reasons that I wanted to play green over the other colors is I had two Evolving Wilds and a Fertile Thicket. Fertile Thicket was fixing, which was great, but also it's green itself. So by playing it, that means that I'm fixing two of my colors instead of just one. If green was my splash color, a single Fertile Thicket fixes for the forest side, the green mana side, as well as getting another color if I need it to. Um, cards like Wasteland Strangler, which are very strong, go down a little bit because it's harder to activate their ability, but I still think I would always play a 3-mana three 3-2 three with a strong ability if I could activate it any amount of the time. Now, the rest of these rares, it, it's going to be hard to tell if they're going up or down. You're not going to play them too terribly often. Um, you know, being able to uh, decipher where your curve is and what you need will decide that for most of your rares, but most of these cards are, are very powerful already. We're actually not going to go through all of the rares. Wait. Did I not? Oh, it's alphabetical. Let's go through the uncommons. Um, the rares themselves, you can compare them to other cards, but usually your rares are going to have that kind of pair level where you're going to want to pay them, play them. Cards like Zulaport Cutthroat, I think, don't lose a lot. Um, the life gain, life loss effects you lose. You don't, you don't get that synergy. But the fact of the matter is the games are going to go longer, draining means a lot more. Transgress the Mind goes up quite a bit. I'm actually a little bit higher on Drift after playing this more. Ooh. But in Sealed, I'm even higher because your opponent's more likely to have bigger cards later, and getting rid of their one or two strong bombs can mean more, right? Because they have a less synergistic deck, they're more reliant on those few bombs. Same applies for any kind of removal like Stasis Snare, but specifically Discard is much better in Sealed than Draft. Cards like Catacomb System, Sifter, which often get kind of passed by in um, draft because they're green, and green is not a very good color, have a chance to shine a little bit more in sealed, even though this you know makes it look like you want to play the green-black sacrifice deck. The fact of the matter is it's three for a three-four worth of bodies that scries when things die and makes mana. That's very strong. Um, ditto for cards like Void Attendant, cards that you'd be afraid to kind of go in on early because you don't know where green's going to turn out, even though it's a powerful card, you can commit a little bit more to because you already know what green cards you have to. Whereas cards like Vile Aggregate are going to go down. Um, heavy, heavy synergy card. Very, very strong in draft. You can build a deck with it. It will be excellent. You can even go somewhere in pack two and have a whole pack and a half or two packs to make it really shine. And in your sealed pool, it's either good or it's not. Now, that said, you're often going to run it, even if it's a 3-mana 1-5 most of the time. That can be good in a defensive deck. It can be good in a deck that isn't particularly worried about having a lot of power on their 3-drops. But it's not going to be the 3-mana uh, 4-5 juggernaut that it often represents in uh, draft. Jotty Offsuit's still not playable. Adverse Conditions is the kind of card that I'm more likely to play in seal, or draft and sealed because tempo is a little bit more important in draft tapping down your opponent's card and attacking a little bit stronger. Archive is a little bit better in uh, sealed than draft because you have more turns to take advantage of the mana it produces and the cards that you can draw with it. I think the Sacrifice Lands are better in um, sealed than draft, which is a little bit awkward. And a lot of that has to do with um, the, the awkward part is you're running more colors more often, so it's harder to play that land. But the benefit is that you often have less focused decks, 
which means you'll usually need to be putting your mana somewhere else and putting it into one of the different kind of um, blighted lands will help you kind of recoup or gain extra card advantage or extra resources over your opponent. Cards like Uthamog for Clamor, just like we saw our opponent played uh, last game, it kind of buys you extra time, even if you don't always have those ingest cards to get something back. Uh, five mana, two five is quite serviceable, serviceable on its own. Uh, Nullifier can be a little bit harder to run um, because it's a double process card, and the double process cards have been quite tough to activate and use in the set as a whole, although the effects are quite powerful. Um, for our deck specifically, I could see us running it pretty often against decks that had stuff that we felt like we needed to counter, stuff that if we didn't answer we would usually lose the game to. Um, or decks were bringing in a 2-3 flash counter a lot. If our opponent was awkwardly running a lot of um, Mist Intruder-like cards, bringing in just a 4-mana 2-3 flying flash is a lot better. Um, Fire Mantle Mage is a card that stays steady, even though it loses synergy from not having as many synergy cards and being as aggressive. The fact that in board stalls, it creates an effect that's very, very strong means a lot more. Cards like Expedition Envoy are trap cards. Um, you can often think that, well, if my opponent's not going to play many two or three drops, maybe playing a two one for one and really getting them early will help a lot. If you don't have the curve to back it up with twos and threes and fours and having a very low curve deck, you're really just going to play a two one for one and your opponent's going to play a three or four drop. And while you may have gotten two or four damage uh, if you play it early, uh, if you play it later, it's not going to represent anything and that's not good enough. So you've really got to have the deck to back it up. Dampening Pulse does more in a format where you're supposed to be playing more cards. But also remember if they're playing just bigger cards, the Dampening Pulse does a little bit less in that situation. I think overall on the whole it is a little stronger rather than weaker though. Morasa Ranger goes up quite a bit because you're more likely to be able to activate the ability. You're more likely to, to have more turns, which means more chances for that landfall, which is more chances to need to sink your mana into it, and less synergistic mana sinks, whether they're uh, devoid cards with activated abilities or different things like that. Cards like Rolling Thunder go up because you have more turns to use them. Cards like uh, Tide Drifter go down because you have less synergy colorless cards to go with them. Um, same for Unified Front. It's still a card I like because it makes multiple bodies. You're more likely to play more color colors, but you're less likely to get use out of the multiple ally triggers. Hmm. Ditto for just two drops in general. You do need to run some, but you're going to get less out of their effects when they're sort of synergy-based effects. Skyrider Elf and Converge in general, I like a little bit more in this kind of deck. Um, you're going to be running more cards, or more colors more often, and you have more turns to get to those colors, so it's going to be a little bit more powerful. <laughs> cards like Herald of Kozilek you're going to be down on because the effects are going to be worse, although I think that Herald of Kozilek is a card you'd almost always run because a 3-mana 2-4 is actually quite good. Um, even if you only have one or two other colorless spells, or even no other colorless spells, it's fine to run a 3-mana 2-4. Usually that's a 4-mana sort of stat distribution. Carrier Thrall making multiple bodies is fine. A 2-drop that sometimes it makes another body. Um, and the difference between Blister Bot and Carrier Thrall is that a 2-1 is significantly more valuable than a 1-1. One, one. Even at the cost of a whole other mana, you really want that 2-1. It's going to trade with a lot more creatures. It's going to represent a much better blocker, much better uh, double with the threat on attacking. It just means a lot more, even though they leave behind the same body. Because, you know, point for point, objectively looking at it, it looks like Blister Pod's a better deal, but the fact that it matters when it comes to uh, sealed and draft and limited in general, two power is just much better than one. Pilgrim's Eye goes up because you need mana fixing, but also goes up because of a flying one damage um, means a lot more. Remember, you're going to have more turns, so it's going to do more damage to your opponent on uh, average. So you're going to have, you know, instead of your Pilgrim's Eye doing four to five damage in the total of the game, if you played it on turn three, it may do five to eight, which, you know, that's quite a bit more. Blade Master is a card that falls in some aspects because it has less synergistic effects. You're less likely to be triggered again, but I think it goes up overall because you're more likely to have more cards on the board. You're more likely to be in a board stall and getting more creatures. Double Strike is more powerful. Uh, so I think overall it's an up. 
I don't think the retreat is still playable for the Korahum. I think Retreat to Armera was a very high card in draft, and it's a very high card in sealed. Even though you are getting less synergistic effects with it, you are getting more turns to get its effect going. Um, retreat to Hagra... You get more effects for it, but it's a lot more synergy-based than the other ones, uh, or the other one, so I'm a little bit cool on that overall. And then Pyrrhic writes, if you have more ways to use it, um, the green-black synergy deck's not very powerful in draft, so in sealed it does offer another resource that you can use, and it is not the worst card to play, um, but it does want to play in a synergy deck, so it's still playable. Titan's Presence falls quite a bit. It's a lot harder to play this card, just because you're even less likely to have the Devoid card you need to make it work. Tunneling of GOP, however, is up. The game goes longer. Your 3 mana 3-2 is great. The fact that it pings for one every time you play a land, also strong. I feel like turn against is better in a sealed format where your opponent's more dependent on one or two bombs because you're more likely to be able to take advantage of those one or two bombs and kind of end the game quickly. Serene Stewart is down as a synergy card. Encircling Fissure is up as a board stall breaking card. Uh, Drawnout's Emissary is down overall as it is weaker in sealed than in its draft, but it's still very, very powerful in the fact that you have more turns is upside. I think overall it is worse in draft than sealed, but I think you should always play it if you can get it. It's extremely powerful. Um, Stone Waker, you know, I'm in about the same place. It's good in some draft decks if they're very aggressive. In sealed, it can offer another sort of body. Um, not a lot to do with that if you can't get it through early, but still a card to look at. Rot Shambler I'm up on just because the green-black sacrifice deck's not a deck you can usually get into due to the weakness of green overall. But in Sealed, uh, Rot Shambler represents a much better threat over the course of the game. It can easily become a 5-5 five, five, or 6-6 six, six if your opponent doesn't answer it early on before it grows larger. Um, spoiler is down. The double process cards are much harder to act with. Infuses up because Converge is a easier deck to get into, and the permanent effect means a lot more. Your opponent only has so many answers, and they're less likely to be able to. The more answers your opponent has to use on one of your two threes that became a five six, they'll have less to answer. You know, your Drowning's Emissary or your Grove Rumbler or whatever other cards you play. Horribly awry. Casuals that counter smaller creatures. Um, at the four mana mark, I think it's still good. I still think it's solid. If it was three or less or two or less, I think I would be down on this card. I don't think it would be good enough. Your opponent's going to run a good curve all the way up to four, but they will not usually run a curve that's very lean. They won't run a bunch of twos and threes often. Uh, grip. Still a good card. Grove Rumbler. Green is better. Grove Rumbler is better. This is the kind of card that was... Would have been good if green was good, but green was bad, um, and synergy was the king of the hill, so it couldn't work as well. But now in a position where you know your four mana attacking five five is doing a lot more work, and having trample is quite strong as well. You grow trender druids, get more turns, but you have less allies. I think that this card overall has dipped down in um, total usefulness. But the likelihood of you playing it is actually up because you're more likely to play green, which is odd. Plated Crusher is just up, up, up of being green. Skitter Skin is down because you're less likely to be in an aggressive deck. Same for the Leopard. I'm up on the Familiar. Flying is better. Death Touch is better. Uh, the life, wing, life Gain was never a real reason for picking this card. It is a bonus, but you pick it because of the flying death touch, not for the temporary boosts. Sharpshooter, I'm up on. You're more likely to be able to activate this, and you're going to have more times to activate this. The ally part is not particularly important. Wind Patrol, you're up on. It's a more powerful card. You can use it more often, even though it's already very high. Forerunner of Slaughter, harder to activate. You're down those kind of cards. Royal's Retribution, I'm up on. Clunky removal is worse in draft and better in sealed. It can be very powerful, and it's more often more powerful in sealed than draft. All the blighted lands are better. Royal Spout is usually going to be better, um, just because you're more likely to be able to get to the six mana. 
Same for Rising Miasma. Down on Retreat to Valakut, it was sometimes okay, and some aggressive decks you're less likely to have those. Up on Retreat to Kazadun, just because you would almost never play it usually, but now you're in a position where you may occasionally play it. You're down on the Synergy cards. Way down on the Processor Salt. To the ground! <laughs> Undo Rising is a card that I think holds pretty level. Um, you're more likely with Undo Rising to be getting um, a more aggressive deck, often with the uh, white based stuff, but the fact that you can break board stalls with the life gain really puts you into a strong position there. Alright, so this is a interesting keep. I'm going to keep this. This is a kind of a bad hand in a lot of ways, right? Five lands, two spells on the draw. But I can definitely cast me a 2-3, which hopefully will buy me some time. And just playing a 4-5 on turn 5 can really push us into a decent position. Now there is a chance that I don't draw another blue source, um, which would be bad, or that I draw a bunch of sources, which would be bad. So this is definitely the kind of hand that could have been mulliganed. <laughs> And I think would have been moderately reasonable, but I don't think we would get a better five. If I had a worse five drop, or if I had a less impactful early drop, I think I would have set it back. Oh, results may vary. Made it to uh, the top seed with us. All right, there's our second island. So that sets us up for Guardian. We've got two spells we can cast, guys. Pow, 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 pow. Oh, this is not good. All right. Let's go ahead and get our swamp. So the good news is we've got our swamp, which means we'll be have a 3-3, three, three, or a 3-4 on turn 4, on turn 3. And if we draw more uh, converge cards, it'll be able to put more pressure on them quickly. All right, the stalwart was the kind of card we'd like to draw. Okay, we're going to save the Evolving Wilds so we can double trigger it off the uh, Guardian, tap one of the creatures, sacrifice it to uh, get another island, and tap another thing. So that'll be a nice play later on in the game. Alright, our opponent is sort of pushing for heavy and chest themes. And they're not going to block. Alright. Let's go ahead and attack. Uh, let's drop our forest. Let's play our painful truths. It's gonna hurt a little bit. We we'll have to discard a card, probably a forest. Actually, we're gonna go ahead and discard this fertile thicket. Yeah. Yeah, we're gonna discard the fertile thicket. No. So we're gonna play the guardian. Yeah, we are going to discard the force because we'd rather hit an island. Assuming our opponent doesn't try to get through with a uh, missing trigger. So next turn we're going to play the guardian. And then we're going to play uh, the sky rider. See if we can get through with the 3-4. It's a free attack. Let's see if our opponent goes to the block. They're thinking about it. would definitely say that it's a consideration. We've got a clutch here to use later. We're going to drop the Guardian, and then after the Guardian, when we have six mana, we're actually going to play the... Um, we can either play the Skyrider for three with a Cloud Mana, and I like playing the Skyrider. Right, opponent with the block. Respectable. All right. Now our opponent doesn't have easy attacks here, so we'll see if they have something else. Now they've been stuck on mana. They got the mana. And a retreat. Very powerful card. Something we'll have to answer quickly. 
Well, there's no attacks. All right, so we can close the complete disregard, the tide drifter, or something else. Um, we can drop the fertile thicket, which will put us at six mana. And I can spend. Three and three. So I think this turn I actually want to play the Sky Rider Elf and the Fertile Thicket. So the next turn I can play the Cloud Manta and the Complete Disregard. So let's go ahead and play the Fertile Thicket first. And let's go ahead and tap down my opponent's Shadow Glider. Okay. Okay. We'll use its ability. We'll put an island on top. Our opponent can ingest that if they want to. Um, and then we were going to. Yeah. Tap three. And play a 3 3 Sky Red Grove. And attack with our 4 5. And that kind of keeps us in a position now. If our opponent plays a land, they can attack with a 2 4 and a 3 3. They did not have it that turn. All right, so we're going to play the island. We're going to tap the 05. We're going to go ahead and attack through with all of our creatures. We're going to try to complete disregard their smaller creature and they didn't have anything so our opponent's probably done here now we could have held this back for a wrath type effect uh, if our opponent had some sort of board wipe we would be incentivized not to have played that they play land and board wipe our board here um, we'll be in a little rough spot they did not all right so we saw some flyers, so I like pulling in the plummet. Um, do we want more high end cards? Is the answer. Do we want to pull out the unnatural aggression? I don't think we do, but I do think we want to drop a forest for a swamp. Now we could pull in more beast masters or other flying cards to kind of stop our opponent from swarming with flying cards but we only saw three of their creatures so it's hard to tell which direction to go in that or what's going to be better so with having seen so few cards i think we're going to keep it the same but we do have a lot of sideboard options um i don't think any of the colorless cards are exciting the wave wings could be good but also going wide, I don't think going wide is quite as good with our opponent having access to uh, the uh, retreat to area. So I think we're going to stay the same with the addition of a plummet and the dropping of our two drop. And the reason we're dropping that two drop a lot is that often it's just not as important and our opponent can have things like O5s or Cards to reduce the toughness, and etc. etc. Alright, so three colors is the keep. 
Interesting that I went to play first again. Alright, let's start with our swamp. I forced. So we want to represent Plummet turn two, and then Stalwart turn three, and then Cloud Manta turn four. Um, we're going to go ahead and make sure we have five mana untapped when we want it. And get our second island now. Should I set us up for that? There is a decent argument to keeping the plummet open in that there's less turns to play the plummet, but fortunately we were not punished. We have a th Three, four for three. Next turn we'll be attacking for three and then playing a three two. Uh, if they play something we can natural and natural aggression, we can kill most of their four drops with our three four. And with the five mana already, we're really set up for a really nice curve here. Um, it'll be interesting to see what our opponent plays. The fact that they had red and we didn't know that before uh, could change things up pretty well. Um, they might not be running that many flyers, or they might just be splashing red for some good removal. We'll go ahead and F6. See, this is a little bit too late on their retreat. Now, if they do play a land, they are blanking on one guy, and etc., cetera, etc., cetera, but not playing anything until turn four is a really rough spot to be in. Um, we're going to go ahead and play the Cloud Manta, because they are the same size, and I'd rather have a flying threat. They can get through. And we'll go ahead and have six. And we'll have six of our opponent's turn. Um, the Hopefully we draw a forest. If we draw a forest, we'll be in a position where we can play the uh, Stalwart and the Plummet, if need be. All right. We did not, but we can. We could clutch it. Um, I think we're just going to plummet it and attack with both. I think that's the play I like the most. Unfortunately, we didn't draw another forest. If we had waited on the uh, Evolving Wilds, it really wouldn't have turned out that much better just because um, we would be tied up in mana in other ways. We'd have into the battlefield tap land. So I just wanted to get out of the way there. Well, it's interesting our opponent's chump blocking already. They probably don't have a lot of things if they're chum blocking this early. Um, many of the threats they can play we can clutch. Let's see what they're putting down here. Angelic Captain is nice. But we can just attack through that as well. Alright, let's go ahead and cast this with Awaken. Let's choose a creature. Let's choose an island. All right, and let's attack with everything. And this is basically a perfect curve out, but it's very hard for opponents to come back from something like this. Um, next turn, we're just going to attack again for nine for lethal. Our opponents been putting a really good, you know, result of playing four and then something else every turn. But the fact that they didn't play three dropper removal spells just set them so far back. Okay. It's a card that would have been able to get them in the game, get them to a decent position. Um, because it would have eaten one of our, our uh, hasty creatures if we didn't draw that land to kind of finish it off here. Now our opponent's in another position where they must once again... Now they can double block, <coughs> but they'll die. So... You know, just playing a spell or two every turn will win you games if you start on turn three and your opponent starts to turn late. Okay, so our opponent is going to play two spells here. Which is definitely a way to catch back up.
Okay. So we can unnatural gestion, kill his five, attack with our creatures. We can play the stalwart, make all of our creatures lethal. They have to block each one. I block here, trade here, block here. If we play the unnatural aggression here, and attack with all three, they got a one. And we're left with two creatures. We attack with these two. They can choose to block either and go to one, but then they'll be down a card. I think I like the stalwart attack with everything. Alright, and our opponent's supposed to block with everything. They'll be left with an oracle. Yep. And we're left with three creatures and they're left with one. So they're basically in a position where they can't come back without very specific cards. Now they could have those. Um, our opponent did make it to the finals. So there's a very strong chance they have great cards. The smite helps. They just need one more card to really push through. Okay, we're going to attack with both of our cards. Now, we could unnatural aggression and kill the Oracle of Dust at one of our creatures. Or we can put our opponent on drawing a land every single turn. I'd rather put my opponent on drawing a land every single turn. And the unnatural aggression, instead of burning one of his other creatures, it's um, hopefully our opponent will play some sort of creature we can actually get value out of it with. All right. Our opponent is building up their mana reserves, as we are. Keep one land back in case we get some sort of triggers, matters, things. I think we're going to start saving our lands in general now that we're at nine. Wow, we've both been just drawing land after land after land. Let's hold off on the Fertile Thicket. Let's see if we're going to go for the billionth land draw. Looks like our opponent has a different option. I'm wrong. We're at 13 lands, and I'm over here on 9. That could be on 11. Lands forever! That's where we're at. See if our opponent can draw anything other than land, or if we can draw anything other than land. 
they're in a lot rougher spot. Um, if they draw a non-land card and it's not the right kind, then they're really just not going to end up in a position where they can do much more. Opponent drew something. A two for one. Quite nice. All right. They stole our three five and they made a mistake. Yeah. They meant to steal our three four, but they spit two colors instead.